Uh, Acts chapter 12, beginning in the first verse. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four, four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring, for, to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was, what was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this book. God, we, pray you, we praise you for your presence. We pray that you would uh, bless our church with your presence, the, the presence of the Holy Ghost, the encouragement that it brings and keeps us on uh, the trail toward home. God, again, we pray that you would bless your words to the hearts of your people and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory for them. For it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Now, uh, some somewhat familiar verses of scripture. Uh, sometimes the acts of the apostles are somewhat avoided because it's so tagged uh, with Pentecostalism in our modern day. But remember two things. First of all, this book is for us and not for a Pentecostal movement. Uh, second, remember this, that the Pentecostals are only about 130 years in their existence. You saw the first move toward that, 1890, 1900, in that, in that, in that neighborhood. So that bo this book needs to be studied by us. We need to know the reality of the acts of the apostles. The, uh, those things are not imaginary. They really did happen, and there's no reason for us to deny that. Uh, the thing that's different with truth and what's taught today, they died with the apostles. They, the apostolic people are gone. Uh, there were only, we know there was a, at least 500 men that qualified that in that, seeing the Lord Jesus in the fe, uh, flesh and being baptized by John the Baptist, but all those people died within the first century of the church. And the only one after that was Paul the Apostle. And that's why it's specifically written that way, is that we as the Lord's modern church see the distinction. Paul the Apostle, uh, I think one time he refers to himself as the Apostle born out of time, meaning outside that window. So with that said, we need to look at this uh, and this is not necessarily an apostolic event, I don't think, except maybe the rescue of the angel. But what this is really about is prayer. Now, it said pr prayer was walked to be made for him or needed or wanted or necessary to be prayed for Peter in this situation. Now, only you can know your prayer life. It's not something that is, uh, that, that is flamboyant. It's not something that can be, uh, even my wife, as close as we are, I don't know anything about Donna's prayer life, really. Right? Uh, and, and it's true for every one of us. Uh, we think of prayer as uh, something maybe in the assembly or at home when we take our meals. But prayer is much deeper than that. Prayer, it should always start with praise. It should start with lifting him up. Not, be, not a give me list that you want from God, but just in pray, praise because he's on the throne. Uh, I can face tomorrow nothing scary because he's there. You know what? That's praiseworthy. The very fact that I don't have to worry about tomorrow is praiseworthy to the king. And that's how prayer begins. Uh, are we going to have problems? Sure we are. Uh, uh, remember when Hezekiah, I think it was Hezekiah, spread out all his problems before God, uh, went up and, and committed that to the name of the Lord? Yes, we're going to have problems. Uh, but prayer 
is our comforter. Uh, prayer is not a magic stone that we rub upon to get our way. Prayer is praiseworthy and prayer is effective. Now, we're fixing to see the church in Jerusalem is about to learn how wonderful prayer is. Uh, in the first verse, now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now, never be surprised of the government's hate for God's word and God's people. You know, we, we sometimes uh, encourage ourselves in the thought uh, that this is a Christian nation and all will be well. Do not deceive yourself in that. Uh, we are a hated, despised people by the very ones we put in office. Mm -hmm. That will never, ever change. Uh, the government has always hated God's people. Uh, if you don't believe that, what happened in Egypt? What happened in Rome? Uh, what happened when they took possession of Jerusalem? It, it is not a new concept that God's people are disliked by authority. And, and the very same thing here, uh, Herod was uh, wanting to vex the Lord's church. Now, uh, vexation means uh, causing problems or slowing down. That's what he wants. You know, you know what? You know what the devil wants for you? He wants to slow down your life toward Christ. He wants to stop you dead in your tracks. He wants to hinder you to the point that you no longer have any zeal for the things of Christ. That's vexation. And, and so that is the desire of Herod because his worst nightmare happened. This king, this king of the Jews was risen up the very thing that he despised and didn't want to happen. Verse 2, and he killed James. Uh, James is the first martyr. Well, I think about Stephen is the first martyr. James is the first apostle to die. And he, uh, he killed him to stop him. He, he really didn't even imagine how it would please the Jews and how excited they would be over it until it already happened. But he killed James. You know what? This is not a life. The life of Christian people is not a life without difficulty. The new, the new thing over there, oh, you just served Jesus and everything's going to be, uh, be good and great for you. That's a lie out of the pits of hell. Yeah. It is not a real thing at all. You know what I found? When it don't work out that way for them people, then people drop by the wayside. And, and, and you know what they learn? Or what they think they learn? Oh, it's just a joke anyway. That, that, that is the problem with that mentality. So we find the government hates them. The government, uh, the government kills one of them. And the Jews, the larger population in that day, uh, outnumbered the Christians by many, many, many. They're pleased. <laughs> you, know, you know what? When another church goes down... The devil's pleased. Not only is the devil pleased, but uh, most of the government is pleased too. Mm -hmm. They're glad when a church closes its door for the last time. And that was the very same situation here. They took care of James, which they perceived as a problem for, for them. Notice when it happened. Uh, and we'll read verse 3. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, it was no accident that Luke threw this in here because how long does that mean it's been? One year. When, when did the Lord Jesus offer the sacrifice? In the days of unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. So one year later... Now they're literally being killed for the cause of Christ. One short year. You ever thought about if you only had one more year to live, how different it would be to look on things? Now, when, when the church was endued with power, 
from on high at the day of Pentecost and for it to be endued with power from on high, it already had to exist, right? And, and, and so when it was endued from power, a year later, people are dying for the faith. That doesn't sound like somebody let's run and have a group hug, right? So when the church is successful, Satan is going to be on the scene. And, and, and so we find that to be true. Uh, James is killed. Everybody's happy. The Jews get excited. And verse 4, And when he apprehended him, meaning that uh, the king, the Herod, saw that Peter was arrested, he put him, meaning Peter, in prison and delivered him to four quaturians, 16 of soldiers, to keep him, uh, to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, I'll just interject in here because everybody knows how I feel about pagan holidays, and America is just chug plum plum full of them. Uh, the reason Easter and all your little bunnies and your rabbits and your eggs and all that foolishness that goes with it, hey, Easter is a feast of fertility, and because it happened near unto the resurrection of Christ and really near unto the Jews' feast day, they took that Roman holiday and that Jewish holiday and they stuck them together. That, you know what? Uh, don't you be involved in that mess. It has no inkling of Christianity about it at all. And, and, and so we find then that uh, as uh, they're, they're waiting to be respectful, if you can be respectful, uh, to get those holidays behind before they kill another one. But you know what? Think about it. They're behaving exactly the same way they, year, they did a year previously because that was a concern when Jesus died too. Remember? They said, we don't, wanna have, we don't want it to happen on the feast day. And then finally, <laughs> they got so mad at Jesus, the Jews said, let his blood be upon us. And they did it any even though it was in that special week of Sabbaths, they did it anyway. And, and so we see uh, Herod not wanting to rock the boat, <laughs> perfect politician, he said, well, wait till the after that has happened. Uh, verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God, for him. Now I want you to notice a couple of different things. First of all, the church was praying collectively. And it said, without ceasing. Now, I don't know you about you, but my problem, my difficulty, my personal challenge with that is I'm not always in a condition to pray. Are you? If somebody makes you mad, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, you're in no condition to pray, right? If you, if, if you got your mind on the back 40, you're in no condition to pray, yeah. right? And all of us are like that, and all of us, our minds are, are, are very temporal and difficult to stay upon spiritual things, and... This, this church wanted to pray without ceasing. Now, the only way that I can, under my mind at least, could see that happening, number one, they were very near unto the days of Christ. Uh, the further we get from Christ, the colder the church gets. Look at Laodicea, right? And, and, and so they had that benefit, but, you know, what we do in nursing, you can't nurse 24-7. So we, we break it up into shifts. We work days and nights, and, and we break it all up. And I, I believe their effective prayer was just that way. The church was meeting continually to pray for this, uh, to pray for Peter, but they weren't there all the time. Some people would go down there, and they would meet together, and they were at Mary's house praying for the deliverance of, uh, of Peter. 
Now, with that said, let's just assume we get in a condition to pray and we're taking shifts. What do you anticipate when you pray? Don't, don't you think that's essential to prayer? What, what, is your, what is your anticipated result? Now, sometimes we use God's sovereignty as an excuse not to pray effectively. You know what? I'm going to pray to the end that I want to see it happen. I'm going to pray for my children that they would be saved and cling only to Christ because you know what? I don't know whether they're elect or not. That's not my concern. That's in the hand of the Almighty and I'm going to give it to Him. You know what the Bible says? Even in these carnal fleshly lives that we live, it is appointed unto man once to die and after that, the judgment. But see, I don't know when people are appointed. Do you? I, I just have no concept of that, so I'm going to pray for him. Brother Jerry's going to have surgery in three weeks. I, I would to God that you pray for him, right? Because we, you know what? I'm going to pray for it like he's going to walk up and down 120 for another 30 years. Because, see, I just, I just don't know. So I'm going to pray to the positive end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it unto the Almighty. You see what I'm saying? That's effective prayer. Now, only you know if that's really how you pray or not. But we should. That should be the, 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 the ground of our prayer. Now, uh, uh, verse 6, Acts 12, verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night... Now, when do we want our prayers answered? Yesterday, right? You know, uh, if you go through the scripture, you don't, you don't find God answering prayers like that ever. And, and why, why does he wait to the last minute, at least in our feeble little minds? Because it gives him great glory. It brings him honor. It lifts him up. It shows him for exactly who he is. That's why. So uh, hours away from being executed, uh, just a, a very short time before his beheading, that's when Christ intervenes. Now, according to Scripture, you have to, you have to go with what the Scriptures say. They're still praying down at Mary's house. When, when is the get off time for prayer? I say it does not exist. There is never a place to stop praying. Now, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance this morning that you may find yourself in, keep praying. Keep, keep praying for what, what <laughs> your request before God. And, and when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, literally right between them, bound with two chains, and the keeper before the door kept the uh, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Uh, so to, to give you uh, uh, exactly what was going on, Peter was chained like this, one on each side. There was guards beside him, and, and, and literally right outside there were the doors that were going into the vestibule back there. There were two more guards there. Yeah. So God begins to intervene. He, he goes against the nature of what we think is right, what we know to be right. Anybody ever picked up a chain and dropped it? What's the result? Ring, ring, it's Right? The best thing I've had, one or two things happen. God silenced it, or he stopped up the ears of those people. One of the two happened. That's miraculous. That's the results of the prayer. Chains make a huge noise when they hit the ground. And they didn't. And they were to give glory to God for that. 
If I was to drop a chain this morning, there's not even the very youngest in the building, uh, which I guess is AJ, would anticipate the result. Some might even plug their ears knowing what's going to happen. But God intervened. That's effective prayer. It's beyond man's comprehension, is it not? It's against what we know will happen, right? That's the results of effective prayer. And we just believe in the modern day that's outside the realm of possibility, but it is not. It is what God is able to do. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. A light shined in the prison. Now, what does light do? At least for me, it wakes me up. Right? Now, we have the two guards sitting there, sleeping, and the, uh, the angel of the Lord comes in, and they don't have light switches to flip back then, but his brilliance lights up the whole room. And again, I'm a soft sleeper, and immediately I was waking up. But see, those guards didn't because God protected him. God, listen, when you sleep and God wants you to sleep, you're out. You're done. You're not waking up. And that's exactly the intervention of the Almighty to, to uh, aid in Peter's deliverance. He, they couldn't even respond to light. And you notice what it says. <laughs> and he smote Peter on the side. Now, I think that's unusual because you know what? To smoke, it, to smoke him on the side and get him going, what, have to, what had to be Peter's condition? He was asleep too. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, knew, if you knew tomorrow the gig was up, would you have peace to sleep? See, he didn't know what God was going to do. The best he knew, he was laying his head on on the chopping block the next morning. Man, that's a piece of God that I'm not sure I possess. That, that, that is something that you're given in that time. That is something that he provides when the time is necessary. And, and so we find that the angel even has to wake up Peter. You know what? Should be no, there should be no uh, uh, Surprise to us because every spiritual truth you know, God woke you to it. You didn't wake yourself to it. From, from the goodness and the grace of God to the third heaven of glory, if you believe those things, God showed them to you. You didn't come to it on your own. And so we see that Peter was woke up by the hand of this angel and raised him up saying, Arise, arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Again, a very noisy occurrence that was silent because of the goodness of God, because there was nothing, nothing there. Verse 9, and he, meaning Paul, I mean, excuse me, Peter, uh, excuse me, let's read verse 8. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. Now I want you to see, he was so comfortable about the morrow's execution that he had his shoes off, and he was in his sleeping gown, and, you know, no worries. And the angel said, You need to get dressed, Peter. We're out of here. Put your shoes on. We're going to do some walking. See, uh, that's a miraculous thing. Uh, and meanwhile, the guards beside him and the guards at the door hear nothing, see nothing. See, that's just for the man of God. It, well, it wasn't for everybody in the room to glory in. It was just for God's man and his deliverance. You ever wonder what... How can people cannot see the glory of Christ? The very same reason they couldn't see the angel. It was not revealed to them. They could not see it because their eyes were not spiritual. They were not focused on the, on, on the things of God. And so we see a very miraculous event at the bidding, at the prayers of the saints. Verse 9. 
And he, meaning the angel, and he went out and followed him, meaning Peter followed the angel, and wished not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. Now, again, don't get too weirded out about this word vision because the reality is this. The apostolic people did have visions. They did under... Remember when Peter was to go over and, and preach to the Gentiles and, and the huge thing of the unclean animals came down and, and took back up and, and the first time it came down, uh, the Lord God said, rise and eat. And he said, not so, Lord God, not, not the unclean thing. And, and it happened again. Th those were very real things. Listen, again, apostolic gifts happened. They were very, very true. And we don't need to deny it. But we do need to know this. They don't exist today. And, and, and so we see that being accustomed to visions, he thought he was just having another apostolic vision. He didn't even think it was really true. And when they pass the first and second ward. Now, the first ward, like I said, going into the vestibule, there were two guards, one on each side, and that door swings open and no response from the guards. You ever thought about the goodness of God that you responded to the gospel? That you were such of a mind that you understood your sin and your need for a savior, but there were people all around you that was cold and blank and dull? That's just like these boys that were standing at attention the door swung open, and they didn't even know it. You know, some will die and go to hell. And the very reason why, they didn't even know it. And so we see only Peter is specifically dealt with because there's prayer going on down at Mary's house. And, and what a glorious thing. And so it says it happens the first time in the first ward, and it happened the second time, and again... The, the, the guard sitting there in full attention and not even realizing people huh, that Peter was going by them. The rest of verse 10, they came unto the iron gate, the very outmost part of the prison, that leadeth unto the city, which opened of its own accord, and they went out and passed through one street, and forthwith the angel departed for, from him. And when Peter was now to himself, he says, now I know of a surety the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod. Amen. Now, <clears throat> while the speaking of tongues and all the and the casting out of devils and the healing of disease is apostolic, angelic intervention is it's still around. I would dare say a group this large that some here are only here because of angelic intervention. Uh, remember, as Paul is writing the church letters, <clears throat> he says, ye have entertained angels unaware. See, he was writing, I think, to the church at Corinth, but I'm not sure about that, maybe Thessalonica. And uh, they, were, they were Greek people. They were Gentile people. And so many, many years after the apostolic day, and he's still saying, hey, the angels are out there. Be very careful how you treat people you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know who you're dealing with. And, and, and so we see then that Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter, it finally occurs to him, hey, this is real. I have been delivered by the hand of God. Have you, have you ever suddenly thought of that about yourself maybe one event in your in, in your lifetime maybe several years ago uh, maybe very recently and you finally occurs to you only God could have done that I am here because God delivered me that that's an amazing thing isn't it that that is an unreal thing uh, I was telling my mother-in-law on uh, 
Wednesday night, I found this article about myself in the paper from 68. And the article said to pray for me. They had discovered the cancer. I was three days old or four days old by this point. And it said, Mrs. Lafferty is fine, but pray for her son. That's miraculous, is it not? 54 years later, here I am. That's the goodness of God. That's a miracle. That, that was, without the intervention of God, I'd be out at the Hildreth Cemetery. You see what I'm saying? God answers prayer. And I fully, I fully believe in the 1960s in the little community I grew up, there were people on their knees for me because, because of the, that one little letter in the paper. So we see sometimes it takes us years to say, oh, God did that. Yes, the Lord intervened, and I wasn't even aware of it, but the Lord did a glorious and wonderful thing. And so Peter came to himself and he realized that. Verse 12, and when he had considered the thing, meaning his deliverance, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname or last name was Mark. Now, he and John Mark, Paul and John Mark had a long history together. And John Mark was a young man and he got scared a couple of times and went back home to mama, <laughs> Mary. But you know, at the end of, <laughs> at the end of Paul's life, he says, send John Mark. Uh, he, uh, see, John matured in the faith. You know, that's, that's what we need to look for. And not only just look for it, anticipate it. And if it doesn't happen, be concerned. Now, if you've got a two-year-old child that's not walking yet, wouldn't you be concerned? But when we've got Christians supposedly saved for 10 years that, that, that don't seemingly have the love for the Word of God, we're not a bit concerned. But we should be. And, and so uh, Peter realizes what's happened. He's seen what God has done for him. And he goes down where he knows the church is meeting down in Mary's house. Verse 13. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate. And a damsel came to hearken whose name, who hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told Peter, told how Peter stood before the gate. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, again and again, you'll see through the Bible that women often get the good news first, like that of the resurrection, about the deliverance of Peter. And she went, she runs in. And she says, hey, he's at the gate. He, he, he's right out the door. And no one believed her. Now, you think about my own experience. 54 years later, who would get the credit? Who would get the, you know, the pats on the back for me living 54 years? The physicians. You know what? Make God, God guided their hand, but it had nothing to do with the physicians. You see what I'm saying? And so we find the church in there, and it says that they thought Rhoda was just telling idle tales. You know what? When we hear of a deliverance, we should rejoice. We should not question the origin of it. We should not be asking, oh, I don't know if that's true or not. We should rejoice with God's people when we hear, you know, the Bible says this, there's rejoicing in heaven over one soul that repenteth. And we should be in the very same way. And so, uh, verse 15, and they said unto her, thou art mad or crazy. And she constantly affirmed that it was even so then said they, it's his angel. Now what that means is, it's his spirit or ghost. It's 
still didn't believe in the very thing they were praying for. God had granted it. God had given it. Peter had been delivered. He was back with his church people. And they did not believe it. Now, if that could happen a year out from the resurrection of Christ, 2,000 years later, what is happening to us? We write miracles off as crafty physicians. We, we write miracles off as, uh, well, you know, I forgot that I'd put that money back, but here it is. We don't give God the credit. Now, young in my ministry, <laughs> And it was the faith of God, but I'm sure some people thought I was haphazard with my large family and my wife. But if I got called to preach somewhere, I would go. And sometimes we had money and sometimes we didn't. And I can't remember where we had went, but I want to say it was, uh, it was up north, maybe Michigan. And they didn't give us anything. Now, I don't go with anticipation but I just know we didn't have gas money to get back to Dover. And Donna, you know, she wasn't very excited with me. And uh, she got to going through the glove box. And she goes, look, she pulled out that bank envelope, had $300 in it. And we had gone on vacation a year before up to the mountains. And we just thought the money was lost. We didn't know what happened to it. And very same envelope, a year later, got us back home to go. You see, that wasn't, that wasn't just, oh, we forgot about that money. That was beautiful. When you're looking at six children with no food and, <laughs> and, and no gas to, to drive uh, 600 miles, you know it's a miracle. You see what I'm saying? Look for them. Look for answered prayer. It happens every day. And when we see it answered, it buoys our faith. It makes our faith stronger. That way when you lay your needs out before Him, you know it's going to be all right. When, 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 you, when you place the soul of your child that's not yet saved into His hands, you know it's going to be all right. That is faith building. And it certainly should be how our prayers are made. But, the, uh, but Peter continued knocking. You know, uh, I preached a whole message one time from that one phrase, Peter continued knocking. And there, there's a whole lot of truth there. You know what? A lot of times we give up when we just think we need to keep working, don't we? We need to keep, to keep the effort going. And, and so we see that he did just that. And, and he, uh, he kept knocking on the door until he got an answer. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. Now, what, what would have been a better response? Well, glory to God! <laughs> he did it! He answered our prayers! He, he, he brought Peter out! I knew he would! I knew he would! No. They were astonished. You know, what a glorious thing to behold. But it speaks ill of their faith, does it not? It speaks ill of our faith. Remember when Peter began to sink, Oh, ye of little faith. The other time out on the sea and they were going and they were to go to the other side and they didn't know where Jesus was. He says, I'm going to dismiss them and I'll meet you over there. And, and uh, when he said, peace be still. And the Bible says, then they worshiped. See, that, it's easy to criticize them, is it not? A bunch of apostles, good grief. Right? See, the thing it is, you haven't been in the storm. Right? See, when you get out in the storm, it's a horse of a different color, right? When, when you're not the one in the dreaded situation, 
it's easy to criticize, is it not? But what we should do as the Lord's people is be prepared for the situation. And listen, you don't get prepared by sitting on your phone. You don't get prepared by not experiencing the goodness of God. And you're certainly not prepared if miracles happen in your very own life and you choose to ignore them. Yeah. You won't be ready. So how about you this morning? <laughs> how is your faith? When a... <laughs> A man sentenced to death comes knocking on your door. Are you going to be ready? Wouldn't it have been a glorious statement of faith if one of them jumped up and said, there's Peter at the door? But it did. It did. <laughs> so what about you? Where, where's your faith at this morning? Listen, we, we live in a very, very odd day. I, I'm not and never have been, Lord Helper, I never will be one trying to predict the coming of Christ. But I do know this. I've never lived in a day like it is today. We need faith, church. When things are literally falling apart around us, we need faith. We need to be able to say, yep, that's Peter at the door. I knew God would do it. We don't need to be making fun of Rhoda, do we? 